thanks uh, so much for attending this uh, this webinar series. So I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, give you a very brief introduction, both to a broader research project, uh, research agenda, as it were, and uh, some specific results that um, that were um, in the in the working paper that was recently released and which Meredith uh, referred to. So I'd like to think of this as a general introduction to uh, the economist's take on epidemiology. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the biology, and then I'm going to talk about behavior, which is the, um, the um, let's say, the margin on which economists really can contribute a lot to epidemiology. And then I'm going to draw out some policy conclusions from the economic analysis that do not follow straightforwardly from the biology. And that will help emphasize uh, why there's a value added from uh, looking at these issues as an economist. So uh, as you all are aware, we are currently facing, in some sense, two concurrent crises. One of them is a, a health crisis because of the uh, infectious disease spreading across the world, which has all the bad consequences that we are now all too familiar with, uh, deaths and, uh, and so forth. But there is also a concurrent economic crisis that has, uh, in some sense, been the consequence of the way we have been uh, needed to, to deal with the, um, the health crisis. Now, in many instances in the past, we have been able, um, we have had at our disposal different kinds of pharmaceutical interventions, such as antiviral drugs, which speed recovery times, and vaccines, of course, which may um, confer some kind of immunity towards um, infection. Unfortunately, uh, at this moment, we have none of those available, and therefore all the policy interventions that we really have at our disposal are what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. And these are behav basically behavioral interventions that work to reduce the contact rate between individuals in the population. So familiar uh, such NPIs are quarantines, self-isolation, but also the closure of um, you know, sports venues, uh, workplaces, schools, and so forth. So these, in some sense, are all behavioral interventions. And so the, this is a good segue uh, into why uh, eco economists are interested in these issues. Uh, as you're all aware, economics is not just a matter of, of GDP and, uh, and, uh, and trade and balances and so forth. It is also about understanding behavior. Um, this is something we all learn uh, as economists. We try to understand why do people make the decisions they do uh, subject to constraints and incentives and so forth. Uh, as Efra Marshall once said, that economics is a, is a broad uh, study uh, subject. It's uh, basically the study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. And it just so happens that ordinary business of life these days is trying to find ways to, uh, to deal with the epidemic um, that we uh, face. Now, a recent tweet by a, a US politician said that epidemiologists cannot know the specific actions of each individual uh, in the community. And this kind of knowledge is not knowable to any scientist. And while economists, of course, will not claim to know exactly what each individual um, is doing, we do think we have the right tools to start thinking uh, systematically about how behavior comes about and how we may go uh, about changing behavior in ways that are beneficial. So let me just remind you of what is the, over, uh, the overarching um, task that we're faced as a society these days. So this is a graph that has been doing the rounds for a few months. And this basically shows a stylized progression of the infectious disease uh, in, in different stages. So the big solid curve in the background is supposed to show what would happen if no intervention were to be taken against the infectious disease. And we can see that there's a very well-known you know, pattern of very rapid increase, then peak prevalence, and then over time, uh, as more and more people recover, the infectious disease then peters out. Now, it was recognized early on that if we do nothing, we might overwhelm the capacity to deal with, uh, with the cases of infected people. And so one goal early, uh, was identified early on was to try to flatten the curves at work. That is, to rather than have this pattern, to have something like the second pattern, which is uh, flatter, but also of longer duration. And that would help us to better manage the fallout from the disease. Now, a very, very influential report was one that was um, written by a group of researchers based at the Imperial College, the so-called Imperial College Report, written by Ferguson and co-authors. This was an epidemiological um, study of what was likely to happen in the UK and in the US 
if we were to do no uh, interventions whatsoever. And that in some sense set the stage for different kinds of interventions that uh, could possibly uh, mitigate the worst effects of the epidemic. And one of the uh, stark numbers that came out of that study was the idea that if, if we do nothing, then uh, up to the order of half a million individuals would die in the UK. And this is, of course, an eye-watering figure, and that uh, rightly you know, spurred people into action and to start to think very hard about uh, how to, um, to do something about it. Now, um, this uh, number of 510,000 people, you can see this is the minutes from one of the SAGE meetings that has recently been released. This number, again, comes uh, here in the middle. You can see 500,000 deaths, and this is, in this case, uh, presented as the reasonable worst case scenario. So this is what basically what policymakers are seeming to be using um, as a benchmark against which they're measuring the effectiveness of policy interventions. Now, interesting, if, if we go back to the actual report, the, they, the researchers at the Imperial College actually hedged their bets a little bit by, by saying that in the unlikely absence of any control measures, or spontaneous changes in behavior, then we would have 510,000 people dead. So this is very clear that they, they themselves find it unlikely. Unfortunately, uh, these caveats have been disappeared out of public discourse and the 500,000 has stayed in the air as being the de facto benchmark. So uh, of course, uh, we don't think it is a reasonable assumption that people do nothing in order to mitigate uh, infection risk. This is a historical example of people, uh, townspeople uh, fleeing the, 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 the plague in, in Milan um, and in more modern incarnations of, of social distancing um, are uh, captured in these graphs. So these are basically uh, Google mobility community uh, reports that show uh, time use in different uh, activities um, relative to a baseline of previous year. So this is for uh, Denmark. You can see that the first four graphs are all things that we would associate with high probability of infection. So for example, retail recreation, being uh, on train stations, being in the workplace and so forth. And we can see that around 10 to 13th of March, there's a very distinct decrease in, in time spent in those places and a, a um, concomitant increase in time spent in places that might be thought of as safer. For example, residential settings or parks, uh, it is thought that parts probably uh, doesn't uh, necessitate close proximity uh, as the other activities would be. Now, one thing that is, of course, has to be also noted is that Denmark actually imposed general social distancing restrictions around that time of this change. So maybe this is not the right graph to think about spontaneous behavior. So instead of that, let's look now at the equivalent graph for Stockholm. So in Sweden, uh, famously, they have had a very uh, laid back attitude to uh, social distancing uh, restrictions. But what we can see is that the, exactly the kinds of pattern we saw in Denmark is also very clearly uh, recognizable in the Swedish data. So you can see that these are genuinely uh, spontaneous changes that people do just out of self-interest and rather, uh, rather than being a an effect of being directed to do so by central authorities. So we believe that uh, that behavior uh, is, is something that uh, it should be taken seriously. And so uh, what I've done in my work is to try to integrate the ideas of economics and the tools of economics into the modeling of infectious diseases. So what, what I have done is I basically have taken these very sophisticated models that have been developed by biologists that are typically described by systems of differential equations. And what I've done on, on, with those models is that I've, I've basically superimposed on those a, an economic model that, on, that it describes and explains the decision-making by individuals in the population. And by marrying these two approaches, I've been able to understand the interplay between what you can think of as the micro level and the macro level. So the microscopic level here, of course, is individual decision making by people like you and me, Deci decisions about whether to send your kids to school, whether you, you want to go to the pub uh, or whether you want to stay at home. These are going to be functions or they're going to be influenced by the aggregate risks of, of doing those activities, which, of course, is a macroscopic phenomenon. So there's going to be an interaction between the micro level and the macro level. 
And this, of course, is an interaction that as economists, we're very, very comfortable dealing with. We've seen that in many other contexts, for example, workers depend deciding how much to work, uh, whether to uh, save, whether to invest and so on. Those are all decisions that depend on, on wage rates, on interest rates and on so forth, which are of course determined at the aggregate level. So this interaction between micro and macro is something we understand and we, we are comfortable uh, studying. So what do we learn from the economic analysis? So this is a very stylized setting. On the x-axis here, we have time. And on the y-axis, I've plotted infectious people. So basically, uh, that the, the dotted line in the background is supposed to, uh, to, to show uh, kind of the unmitigated scenario that I showed you in one of the first slides. So this is the, the projection of infected people across time in a purely biological model. On top of that, I've shown you uh, two graphs uh, in solid. Let's just focus on the black one. The black one is the progression of infectious disease of infected people in the biological, sorry, in the economic model, where individuals make decisions about uh, whether or not to expose themselves to the infection, or rather, they make decisions in a sophisticated, self-interested, and spontaneous manner on social distancing. And the great takeaway point from here is that if left to their own devices, according to the model, people will actually act to mitigate the worst excesses, as it were, of the infectious disease. And therefore, we would actually have some flattening of the curve just because of people trying to protect themselves. So, so let me just summarize what are the kind of the big points from this, um, from this model. So the first one is that uh, people actually act to self-protect. They do so simply because they don't like becoming infected. And if you don't like becoming infected, you are willing to do something that is costly in order to avoid that. Now, what that means, of course, is that the biological worst case scenario that was put forth in the Imperial College report is probably not the appropriate benchmark. It's not a realistic benchmark because people will act to some extent. So this is the first takeaway point. The, the biological benchmark is probably not appropriate for a model of human diseases. The second thing that should be noted though is that although we are going to have some measure of social distancing just because of people's own self-interest, that does not mean that we should do nothing. And this is an important thing to emphasize. The, the, the fact remains that there are typically uh, positive externalities between individuals in this kind of models. That means that if I choose uh, how much to socially distance, I may not factor in the fact that my decisions have positive or negative um, uh, influence on other people's well-being because I could infect them. And as we, as we know from basic economics, when there are positive externalities, people will typically underprovide those. And, and so the next question then becomes, how do we properly align private incentives with public uh, health goals, and there, of course, there's a host of different possibilities, but they all um, in, they all involve different uh, measures such as sticks and carrots, fines, social norms, furlough schemes, and so forth. Going forward, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go further in this work. I'm going to I have started understand, trying to understand better what is the role of asymptomatic infection. So if you don't know whether you're infected or not, that may actually influence your behavior. Uh, what is the behavioral consequences of testing? So for example, if I go out down to Boots and get tested and I know now that I'm infected, uh, that might actually change my behavior. And so thinking carefully about how to roll out testing schemes might actually be important for understanding what is going to be the behavioral consequences of those uh, rollouts. And then there's a host of other problems that, uh, that we can look at in this setting. For example, what are the effects of population heterogeneity, or what is the interaction between behavior and policy, and this is important going forward if we want to make sure that the policies we put in place actually achieve what we wish them to achieve, and that they don't have un, uh, undesirable, uh, un, un, unexpected and undesirable consequences.